In the cranial adjustment field, there is a concept called the reciprocal tension membrane, RTM for short at the moment anyways. And it's actually an older concept. It's a concept that's been around right since the beginning of working with the cranium and the sutures and the cerebral spinous fluid and the meninges. And even though it's not a widely accepted thing, even though those who understand it and those who try to work with that concept for treatment of the skull, even though they are a minority, there is some good research happening. As, as we understand the connective tissue layers of the body, as we come to understand that they do have a contractile element too, concepts like this become easier to prove. And hopefully in the future we can talk about it more openly and have scientific justification for what seems to be an observable, palpable phenomenon. The most important thing, the thing that uh, is key to understanding this concept is that the tissues share pressure. And they should really always do that. That's what tissues are, are kind of made to do. And this is a protective thing. So if we're looking at the brain, understand that I'm just going to remove these layers here. Understand that the sutures of the skull cover all these things up. The skull bones and the connective tissues that fuse them together, not fuse, that's a bad term, that uh, bring them together, join them, cover up the brain and then the meninges surround that and so we want actually to protect that brain from any kind of trauma any impact traumas coming in from the outside would be potentially disastrous to that brain if we didn't have some kind of a system to share the pressure the skull can protect but should any particular bone fold in were it to come inward it could compress that brain quite directly and this would be catastrophic the brain is akin to to jello the living brain is very very soft and smashing it up against the skull is a really bad idea or conversely smashing the skull into it is is terrible so it's a protective mechanism that makes it so that we have this reciprocal tension membrane around the brain ultimately what it wants to do is divert the pressure so let's say we take a, a force to the side of the head it wants to divert the pressure circumferentially. It wants to divert it around the brain. So it ends up sharing that load throughout the system. We've got, of course, our CSF layer, let's say represented by the blue here. We have, of course, got our men meningeal layer, the dura, the pia, the arachnoid. And it contains that cerebrospinous fluid within it. And these are protective of the brain. But they also fuse those tissues, they fuse the brain in a way to the skull. So they're shared, they're sharing the load, they're a shared tissue. To divide them up really doesn't make a lot of sense. You have, you need a scalpel basically to divide them up. The body doesn't divide them up. So it wants to turn that force and make it divert around the brain instead of impacting directly on the brain. And again, it can do this through the incompressibility of fluid, but there is also a contractile element to the tissue. There's a way in which these fibers will tense up and it has to be very quickly for this to work. Tense up to make it so that we can pull from one side to another. So if we get even a little bit of pressure, it should be that we get a change, a pull all the way around, all the way around throughout those dural layers to make it so we're not pressing on the brain directly. It is a good system, but of course it's not perfect. It is far from flawless. And over time, we can actually build up shifts in the cranium. We can build up ways in which the bones can go inward and outward, and usually both, because of this same protective mechanism. So let's say, for instance, and I'm going to exaggerate this heavily by, by drawing this in. Let's say we've got something, it's pressed in on this side, as if it was a bit indented this way. And on the opposite side, it's kind of outpouched or pushed out there. If we're looking at more of a side profile, and this is just kind of a common finding, it's pressed in here where the sutures meet up and it's coming out, I'm gonna draw it on the same side, it's coming out this way. So it's in over here, it's out on this side. This is kind of a common shift. So you get from a posterior view, a back view, you get this kind of a pushed out at the top right and a pushed in at the top left. Not left and right exclusively, I'm just talking about a, a general pattern. So it's running through as a pathway of force, it's doing that. And this is actually beneficial 
Remember, these tissues are very pliable. You want this compensation pattern to be there. If you could somehow gradually, and again, this can be very slow, gradually push this side in, but we had a resistance here, it stopped it, you'd basically be pushing brain, even if slight, even if very, very slight, you'd be pushing brain into the one side of the skull. And over time, this could be detrimental. So this is an example. This is just one example of many you could make. Now, what we can do in this situation is use the mechanism that brought this on to correct it. That's very, very important. When we use a, its own mechanism, the reciprocal tension membrane, to fix a problem, what we encounter, and this is true of any practice that uses the body's own reflexes or, or, or fascial mechanisms, we encounter no resistance from the tissues. So imagine instead, that's instead, I wasn't using this, using this reciprocal tension membrane. I, I didn't want to, to correct it using its own important and natural mechanisms. I just wanted to thrust that skull back into place. I said, oh, it's out, guess what, wham, I'm gonna smack it back in. It probably wouldn't like that very much. We've talked about in a couple other videos what the cranium likes based on how it's constructed, that's worth taking a look at, but it doesn't like to be forced harshly into place. It's, it's a very bad idea for lots of, lots of reasons. So if instead I was to gently, using the body's own mechanisms, use force to adjust it in a way that it likes and is used to moving, we'll encounter no resistance, that's the key, no resistance to our treatment method, to our adjustment methods. Ultimately, this means less effort too on our part. We don't have to do nearly as much. We can use smaller amounts of force. We can use just a tiny bit of pressure, just a tiny little bit of pressure, and you'll find that it's easier on you, it's easier on the patient as well. This is very important. At the same time, using the body's own mechanisms to correct itself, it is aware of what's happening. It's in fact used to it, and it can control the mechanism and hold it in place better. These are very important things. So ultimately, if we use the body's own mechanisms of correction, it doesn't require as much effort on our part, doesn't require as much effort on the body's part to hold it after the adjustment. It must be aware of what's going on, not a foreign outside force coming in, something it knows well. So as an example, just a really, really simple example. In fact, the explanation takes longer than the process. But let's say I wanted to push this back into place. And when I say push, I do mean very gently. I wanted to correct the problem. We don't have a suction cup that I know of that works over top of hair. I really wouldn't want to do that. So let's say we put a suction cup here. I'm saying don't do this. And we pulled out on this bone. Not a, not a great way of doing it. You could try, but don't do that. Instead, what we can do is properly direct the force. Maybe this was the initial impact over here. But now our point of leverage is on the opposite side. I can't really reach my hand in and grab this and pull it out. Again, suction cup, you could try, but Instead, if I gently push into this, naturally the force is diverted to the opposite side. So it gets brought around quite normally. It's as if, it's as if, this is not what's happening, but it's as if it was being direct and pushing it out that way. That color did not work. There we go. Hey, darker red. So it's as if it was pushing it out from the inside. So the part that's coming in, we're pushing it out. Now it's not gonna work exactly that way. It's not gonna be that simple. That would be way too easy, way too easy correction. So understand that as we do this, it's sharing. Naturally, it wants to share the load through all tissue, so it's going to go throughout the whole system when we put pressure on it. But we can more specifically direct that pressure. So again, we've got this pressure exerted here. We're pushing the out part in, and if we create what are called fixed points, we stop the movement from occurring here and here, really at the top and the bottom of the curve, and though it is a cranial curve, it still counts. It means this right here becomes the pathway of least resistance. It ends up being that by stopping the points above and below, and this is true of really any curve in the body, the spinal curves are fantastic examples of this, 
by stopping the points above and below, we make it so that there is little place else for that tension or that pressure to build up. And it should be, ultimately, and we hope, and this is worth trying, that the cranium and the skull bones allow a relaxation of the tissues, a, a myofascial release, because there are, of course, contractile elements, and it allows that in part to come out, even though we didn't directly touch it. Again, this uses the inherent mechanisms of this existing system, so it will be relatively easy. The body will understand it, it will not resist it, and it will be better able to hold on to it. And it should be easy for us because it makes things just fall nicely into place. Failing that, of course, you know, maybe you want to look at the spinal column and see if any pulls on the dura below it are causing it, and then any muscles that attach should be worth looking at too.